Um, yeah, I'm not. I, I'm still this Zoom thing. Sometimes I'm a little slow on it, you know. Well, but, you know uh, when it starts, you press record. Everything going. So you after, got and and then you edit the little pieces that you need to trim in, and you just keep on going from there. Thank God, you can make me sound like somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Martin, first thing I have to say, you got some incredible looking marshals there that's like a 1959 series yeah yeah let me let me let me i'll, wow. I'll turn around for a second here I, i've actually got more than this but that bottom marshal that is a 1969 metal front and uh that's a germino okay. lead 55 now i've got a 1967 um Plexi 100 watt super one, super lead 100. And I've got a 68 super lead 100 Plexi, and I've got a couple of little Plexi 50 watts. You know, uh, so you like Marshalls too? Oh yeah, I love the old ones like that. You know, what Jimi Hendrix and you know yeah. all the greats played. Absolutely. And then I got over here a few of the battle axes over here. You see those? Nice. That, right there is the 58 Les Paul. Hmm. Nice. 64. ES 335, uh, 62, uh, that's a 64 ES 345, uh, that's a Billy Gibbons, Pearly Gates, and the Strat, if you see it, that's a 57 Strat. So we got a few little little interesting tidbits here, you know, things. Hey, Greg, behind those, those um, great guitars, that's like a whole wall of CDs? Yeah. Oh, so gosh. <laughs> Wow. There's three three full walls of CDs. Then back over on this side are box sets. You know, yeah, I've got CDs all over the place, man. Uh, plus albums. I've got a few albums here and albums out in the garage. Uh, I'm I'm a addicted to music, as uh, I'm sure you are too. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what's great is we can just always get new material out. Like all of a sudden. Kentucky Head and Hunters has have a new album. That's right. You know, so music never stops. That's correct. And we have a new album. That's a Fact Jack, which was released in October. Uh, it's on CD. Unfortunately, it's not on vinyl. But of course, you could download it. You know, through uh, whoever you buy your music from, and it's on the streaming platforms. Um, it's a way different than when we started recording our first album back in 1989. Back then we had vinyl, we had CD, we had cassettes, we had singles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Remember singles? Yes, yes. Like the yeah. mini cassettes. One yes, song. Sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Two songs, yeah. We missed the eight track thing. Oh, somehow we never made eight track, you know. But uh, we were lucky enough to still be a part of the original vinyl train. And our first album was uh, released in North America, and it was it was released everywhere on vinyl. Second album, Electric Barnyard, only was released on vinyl in just a few spots, you right. know. And you could, if you buy one of those, it's on import. But uh, yeah, man, it's a different world now how you get your music. You yeah, know, like right then the, when you guys started out, the, the vinyl business was going out of, of style. You know, the CDs were taking over at that time. Exactly. Exactly. When we we first hit it, the CD rage was in full swing. And I don't know when vinyl when did vinyl? I'm not sure when vinyl kind of bit the dust there for a while. It didn't ever completely bite the dust, but it did, you know. It, it, did. it, it it went away. It went away for a long time. I quit buying vinyl. I don't know. I quit buying vinyl in the early 90s, I think, or yep. 1991. I started buying CDs around 87, 88 when they first started coming out. And um, I bought my first CD player, which was really expensive at the time. I'm thinking it was like $300 maybe or four, you know. Hey, and uh, hey, yeah. Yeah, gosh, I, I bought it at a, uh, it was, I'm in Glasgow, Kentucky. There was like a, this, there was this place that had TVs and stereos and, and they would get, it was like a shipping, like, like maybe there was an overstock company. They would send things to the store and I ended up buying 
my first CD player there. I also used to buy, you remember the mini disc players and recorders? Yep, yep. I had those as well, you know. We've been through lots of different audio over the years. Yeah. From what I recall in Canada, like in Nova Scotia when when I was too old, um, (laughs) I had a choice buying a cassette or a record, and I went to the cassette. Did you really? Yeah, Yeah. because the the records were going out of style, and you could see it in the, the local Kmart at the time. So little small section, but you see cassettes everywhere and, and CDs are starting to come in, right? So That's exactly right. You're right. Well, the cool thing back in the early 90s, actually back in the 70s, I, were, I, was, I bought a nice Pioneer cassette recorder and I would make my little mixtapes like that back then. You know, that was my original, like have you, you have your little uh, song song list or what, what do they call that where you you've got your you know i, I don't use a, a playlist. iPhone. yeah yeah your playlist I, the original playlist was just on a cassette you know like that and i make my i take it right from vinyl over to that i mean i might be it might have poco on one song or led zeppelin cream Norman brothers graham parsons or whatever you know and uh so i was doing that and the cool thing about cassette you can make your own cassettes to listen to in the, in the van or car or whatever you know and the when cds came out we didn't have the luxury of having cd burners just it took a little while to get those in there again in the beginning of the cd thing cd burners were really expensive yeah. at first you know in the late 80s early 90s they were extremely expensive but now you know, I still I still buy CDs. Do you still buy CDs at all? Yes, I do. That's that's what you get at I mean, Walmart, basically in Canada. CDs. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And that's what we have in Glasgow, Kentucky, where I'm at today. Uh, we uh, we have a Walmart, and it's about the only place you can buy music here in this town. Okay. Uh, they have they do have vinyl. They have vinyl. Not a whole lot of selection. But they've got CDs, and I, even there for even a few years ago, they were starting to uh, people were starting to bring cassettes back. Mm-hmm. I remember Cheap Trick putting a either I put a oh no Cheap Trick actually did an eight track. For, <laughs> I don't know you you have to check me on that, but I don't want no part of eight track. I had an eight track when I was in high school. I had an eight track player in my my car and my little Nova, and I was going around listening to my Mountain and my <laughs> Ten Years After, uh, Cream and stuff like that. But right in the middle of, uh, if you listen to the Almond Brothers, right in the middle of Elizabeth Reed, it would go, it would fade out, big old click, you know, and then it would fade back in. Yeah. But uh, conclusion and then uh, introduction, something like that, like part one, exactly. part two. Yeah, exactly. And a track last. I don't know when they went away. Not soon enough. <laughs> yeah. But I remember working at an electronic store in Louisville that sold stereos and music and records. And, and we had a, a big rack of a tracks. And you, you could walk over to the rack and had like little holes where you could reach in and look at the a track. But the, you couldn't take them out where people could steal them or whatever. And that was and I quit working there in 77. So A Track was still happening. So I think I think A Track probably what do you think? Did it make it to about 1980 or so? Yeah, it actually made it to like 1982, I do believe. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. At least it's in one, that's incredible. You know, time traveling yeah. with all these things, and you know, um today it's mostly digital. Like you guys are releasing, you know, or released a new album. And the only venues now is like, you know, let's stream it on Spotify and, you know, have it on YouTube and yeah. um, CD sales. I mean, it changed a lot. And, and, and I'm sure you're seeing it. So how, how's yeah. like the internet department for, for the group now? Like Kentucky headhunters head, head are like online and, yeah. and, and we're getting the stats from the people. So it's like, it's kind of like a radio station in a sense, the internet. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know? It is. The, the people it, who it is. In. 
it's a whole different world, you know, and I got on the internet around 96 or 97. And initially I just had a little Mac computer that I bought at Walmart. It was like a, it was a, it wasn't a really great Mac and I could initially, I couldn't even surf the internet. You know, I, I was, I could do email, which, you know, was a big thing. That was a big thing back then. And then, uh, we I had AOL originally, and then as we went along, uh, I was able to start getting on the internet, looking around. Of course, if you go back to the nineties, you remember how the internet was. It was way different, way different. Um, but that's where the the revolution started. That's where it started. And now, how music is delivered is totally different than when I started buying records in nineteen sixty five. My first record I ever bought was California Girls by the Beach Boys. And the first album I bought was Herman's Hermits on Tour, you know, or Pet Sounds by the Beach Boys. And now, I mean, if I today, if I wanted a, a new album by Tedeschi Trucks or somebody, and I, and I can't buy it here in Glasgow, either I'm going to order a hard copy, which I'm sure you can get those in vinyl, or you can go download the Dab Blasted album from Amazon or wherever you get your music. And that's the way our album is, too. It's just a whole different world, you know, whole different world. And uh, streaming is a big part of that. People got their, like you say, they got their own playlist. And um, I don't really have that. I've got, I, if, when I, if I go out walking, I'll, I'll find an internet station or something like that. Um, but I I have, in the past, used to have a like a little Jimi Hendrix playlist or a Almonds, but now, right now, I don't do that. I just go listen to an to a internet station and be surprised at what I'm going to hear, you know. Yeah, because sometimes it's like the surprise is good because they're picking out the music for you. And I love to tune into a station and hear something I've never heard, you know. Um, you know, a lot of times you tune in, you'll hear Cat Scratch, no, nothing against Ted Nugent. Uh, I've heard Cat Scratch Fever a lot. I've heard um, Statesboro Blues a lot. But man, it's really neat when you can, it, if you tune in a station and you hear some obscure group, you know, such as Curved Air or something like that. Uh, or here, here um, there, there are some good bands out of Canada. Uh, what what was it? Crowbar. Remember Crowbar? Oh yeah. Oh what a feeling. <laughs> oh what a feeling. Yeah. Major hit. Yeah, I've got some crow crowbar and King Biscuit Boy. Yeah. I've got that album, Official Music. I love that album, you know. And uh, there's some great musicians out of Canada. Of course, one of my old friends he passed on was Zal from the Love and Spoonful. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure he he was I never can remember where he lived at, but I'm we love Canada. I mean, and we've been up your neck of the woods too. We've been all over Nova Scotia, you know. Well, the band sure, certainly did travel a lot um, with, let's say, cassettes and uh, CDs back down it, this way. Because um, I'm sure if you go to every tent house, there'll be a, a CD of your band there, you know. Probably picking on Nashville. Probably, because it, it, it went like what? Double platinum or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, with double platinum, it did really well in Canada, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, that that album that laid a solid foundation for us. Certainly did, certainly did. That was released in October of 1989, wow. and originally, originally, Jason, the first version of it independently. You see that right there? Yeah, yeah. That's picking on Nashville. That's the version we sold out of our cars. And then when we signed our deal with Mercury Records, this only had eight songs on it. We uh, signed a deal, went in and remixed these songs and added two songs, and that became the version that you grew up with. Okay. You know? But that was the original version right there. Wow. I Actually, it was it was in the other room. I said, well, you know what? I'm going to bring us in here, show it, show it to you guys, because... You can't, you don't see that very often, you know. We did also do a little 45 record before 
uh, picking on Nashville, we did a different versions of Oh Lonesome Me and Walk Softly. We recorded those two versions at uh, Acuff Rose in Nashville. And we <laughs> that was another little record we sold at local record stores and at gigs and things like that. And it don't even sound like you could hear some of the semblance of the, of the band, but the band hadn't matured yet. Right. It really started to come to what the, it's what it was supposed to sound like on picking on Nashville. But, uh, man, it's been a long journey, man. Been a long journey from going from, from this yeah, yeah. to that's a fact Jack, you know, let's say for the new album, you have two singles pronounced, you know, like that's a fact Jack. And, um, how could I, yes, sir. How difficult was it to pick out the singles on this one? Because your, your, um, Songs are pretty solid on the, the whole album. And, Thank you. And where do you go to say, well, number two is going to be one single and and mm -hmm. and not the first one? Um, I believe, you know, how could I? The first single that was written by Blackstone Cherry, which is family. You know who Blackstone Cherry is, yeah. I'm sure, right? And, and Richard helped write that with them. And uh, while we were recording the tracks for That's a Fact Jack, Richard had a demo of the song, which was a totally different sounding track the way they did it. We just kind of stones it up a little bit. Uh, we we kind of made it sound across between the Rolling Stones, Jojo Gunn, and the Georgia Satellites, but really it's got that head on our sound. And uh, I don't know, it just felt like that would be a good, good, solid song to come out of the box with. And then the title track, uh, that's a fact, Jack, uh, with How Could I, you got uh, Doug sings that. And then Richard sings That's a Fact, Jack, which is the more of the rockier track. They're both kind of rock. I mean, they're both rock and roll. They're not, they're not stone country. But uh, I don't know if there's really a dead set way that we pick a single and the, those two just felt like the, the way to come out of the box, you know, those two. And let's say Greg, when you, when you went in the studio, you know, with the ideas to make the album, mm -hmm. how long did it take you to you know start and finish? I mean, because now it's like all digital recordings and, and yeah. you, you go yeah. and it's a little bit simpler sometimes, but it can be maybe tougher in, in, in some yeah. other aspects yeah. of it. Well, I'm going to take us back to 2019 when the world was kind of normal. We were touring. We did our regular normal touring year. Uh, you know, we knew at some point we were going to have to do an album. But we thought probably 2020 was going to be it. And uh, we finished up our 2019 year. We took off some time to spend the holidays with our family. And uh, then we went into 2020 and we done about four shows. And the last show we did pre-pandemic was uh, February of uh, February 2020. We played at the Birchmere in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, we knew we had about three weeks off after that. And we thought we'd reconvene, hook back up and go back out on tour. And then probably at the end of the year, we'd get together, go to the old practice house or do it on the road. We'd, we'd start looking at song ideas and go into the studio in November. But with the pandemic, as you know, we, we took off after we played that show in February, we took off about a week uh, into March. The show started falling out getting moved we ended up doing nine shows in 2020 and whenever we did play a show it was just really strange and eerie because everybody was social distancing and being really careful and uh i ended up getting COVID in uh, november of 2020 at the end yeah uh, not a bad case but I, i missed the very last show we had to get chris robertson from blackstone cherry a pinch hit for me by the time I got through it, it was Thanksgiving. The holidays were with us. So we said, well, we'll just have to reconvene, get back together early 
2021 and start thinking about doing this album because you know the year was done um we went into 2021 we had some weather hit us we finally went to the studio in february uh of last year and it took about a day we we set up and it took about a day for us to get back in the groove because our chops were down we hadn't been we hadn't been together very much. We had we weren't as sharp. We weren't on the road. We weren't just we were a little mush brain, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the second day we laid down a track. We ended up doing about a track or two. About usually it was about a track a day. So I mean, I mean, about ten days we were done with the album. Two weeks, the tracking. We did overdubs. We made sure the vocals were right. And then we went into the mixing mode. And so the whole album was pretty much done mixing. Um, I don't know, mid-February to, we were done about six weeks or something like that, you know. And then it was uh, mastered by Rodney Mills, who was a great, great mixer himself, but he, he did the mastering. And the album we went through last year, we were back on the road. We did about 45 shows and we were, initially going to release it on another label and that didn't work out we had ended up changing plans and going through another label and securing the deal and getting the artwork together getting the paperwork together going through lawyers and lo and behold it finally picking uh, uh, that's a fact jack came out in october of last year so so as you can see it, it was it wasn't uh, a, a long drawn out process but it took us just a little bit to get get it together so to speak yeah i mean considering you're really playing much shows at the time so yeah and that's oh yeah cool. yeah cool. and when we didn't have time to get together and write together so people were just bringing songs into the studio we were sending ideas back and forth through email a little bit and um you know, but it, it, we just basically worked things out on the floor, you know, and somebody would say, hey, I, oh, I like, that's a fact, Jack. Richard brought that. And um, I, don't, I don't know, man, that, that little, I don't know if you can, that little, I'm a, that little riff there. Uh, we came up with that on the floor, you know, and yeah. that, that's kind of the hook along with what Richard does. So basically somebody bring the skeleton outline of a song and we would finish it up right there and then hit record and get the best take we could. Right. Yeah. And so that's, there you go. that's kind of the best way to record to start with, you know, going back into the roots of recording and writing. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I think if you, if you spend too much time on a track or, then you lose the feeling of it, you know. Back in the old days, gosh, bands would, you know, they they would record live, and you know, I mean, some of the old records we grew up with. I mean, there was some overdubbing, but I'm sure the the first Led Zeppelin album was bam, you know. Yeah. Then they were back out on tour. You know, there was an urgency to it. You know, yeah. it was fresh because music no gets stale. Either. What's that now? There's no mistakes here on this stuff, you know. They're that good. No, no, we don't have any, mis you know, we, we're sticklers about trying to get things right. Now, we will always pick the feel over the technical thing. We want it to feel right. Mm. And, I mean, we don't we don't want a mistake on there. I mean, sometimes I'll listen back to something I've done. I went, I, I could have done that better. But you know what? It's an in-the-moment thing. And um, I feel like it's a very solid album. Uh, it represents the band really well. It's very diverse. It's a very, very eclectic band vibe about it, you know, and it represents all sides of the band. And Greg, I, I see on the website, you guys got tons of tour dates all of a sudden, you know, you, yeah. you're going from March to October, full blast. It's well, not, almost full blast, let's say. No, that's incredible. And um, mm -hmm. it, is everything just opening up like wide open now? I think things are really, I, the climate out there is better. I, I believe people are calming down. Um, Omicron, the, the, you know, this last variant seems to be 
declining. Uh, we did 45 shows last year, which was a little down for us, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad year. We worked, we worked pretty hard. And, um, you know, I think this year is going to be way better for everybody. Mm -hmm. I hope I, I feel like it is. Yeah. There's, there's quite a few dates and there's more coming in. So we're ready to get back out there and get our calluses built back up, man. You know, are you a guitar player? Yeah, I am actually. Electric? Electric. So and, you know you, you oh, know yeah. the callus thing. You know all about the yeah. calluses and all that. You gotta play all uh, the time to keep it up, you know. Yeah, I mean, hey, when I had when I had COVID back in November of twenty twenty, it wasn't a bad case, but I was really fatigued. So I just slept. I, my my calluses got soft when I got through that. That was the only time I can remember since I was a young man, that I almost lost my calluses. Wow. So, so it was weird. It was weird. Yeah. It's, so, it's not something you want to feel on the tip of your fingers. It's like it, it's something you always, it's always there. You know? yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah. But uh, we'll be back on the road. We'll be promoting the album. And uh, we're lucky that we're still around to do it, you know, after all these years. And like Greg, when you when you do go on tour, how many boxes of CDs you bring to promote this stuff? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's going to be selling some. So oh yeah, I mean, well definitely. yes, we do. We we got quite a few. We bring quite a few CDs with us to sell because that's the whole thing. Uh, well, we've got the new album. Then we got uh, different albums that you can. Some of our albums are out of print now. You know, yeah. some of them some of them are gone out of print, unfortunately, but. You know, we still sell Picking on Nashville. We still sell On Safari, uh, Live at Ramblin' Man, uh, Meet Me in Bluesland. Uh, I'm not really sure what else we got. Like Best Of, which was released on uh, Mercury Records. But we, yeah, we got quite a few CDs we bring with us. And then we do have a few vinyl copies of On Safari. There was a few released of that one. Uh, that was 2016. Okay. So yeah, we'll be out there selling the merch, man. And, and I was, I was the reason I was laughing because in my bunk, you, you said I thought I thought you said how many boxes of CDs are you going to bring? Because man, I'll bring I'll bring a big old box of music to listen to in my bunk to yeah. keep from going crazy, you know, so to speak. It could be Buddy Guy, or it could be Led Zeppelin, it could be the Almond Brothers, it could be Albert King, BB King, or whatever, you know. To keep the brain occupied while you're on tour. Do you yeah. keep busy when you're on tour? And, you know, is it as fun as it always been? Oh, yeah. The playing, the playing is, is wonderful. And the camaraderie and the fellowship with the band is great. Uh, I love, hey, man, the, the riding on a bus is not that bad. I don't sleep as well on a bus. The traveling is a little harder than it was than when we were younger. I've been on a bus riding around working on a bus every year since like 1981 you know so this is a this is like 41 years on a bus and before that i was in a van or step van or whatever it took to get to the gig you know uh but yeah it, it's still oh, the playing part still fun because i think the band plays better more in the pocket now than it ever played you know i think it has a better groove and we far off of each other better, you know, and uh, I don't mean to bra be bragging, but I think it's a really good band, <laughs> you know, and I'm with my, my friends. I get to play with my friends, you know, and family. And that's good. Greg, before we finish off here, um, yes, like sir. you mentioned something like, you mentioned Jojo Gunn earlier. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's not yeah. a name you hear too often here. That's right. That's, uh, um, that was Jay Ferguson's band. Jay Ferguson and Mark Andes were with Spirit, and they formed that band. They left Spirit to form JoJo Gunn, 72, I believe, and they grabbed Curly Smith on drums and the other Andes brother. I can't think of his name, the slide player. Uh, what is his name? Mark and there's another Andes brother, great slide player. Wonderful. And they were a big influence on us back in the 70s. 
Mm -hmm. A lot of people haven't heard JoJo Gun, but we 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 have, and we love JoJo Gun. Yeah. And I'm not sure if you know, I do a radio show. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. I, I've been doing a, it's a blues radio show. It's called The Lowdown Hoedown. It airs every Monday night from 7 to 10 Central Standard Time on WDNS out of Bowling Green. And it can be listened to on the internet worldwide, uh, WDNSFM.com or w, uh, www. Let's see the other oh d93 rocks.com and so i've been doing that for like actually 22 years uh 20 years at one station and one of the things i love doing i play blues i play r&b but i like playing bands i have a thing called the psychedelic snack i call it and i'll bring in iron butterfly or i'll play jojo gun i'll play spirit uh i play the naz or something like that uh, or crowbar whatever right you know and it's just it's just a fun time three hours on monday night i get to do that and it's just a thrill to it's like inviting somebody over to your living room and saying hey have you heard this before you know and yeah. last night i was playing a lot of buddy guy i got to play with buddy guy friday night by the way oh, wow. in louisville got to jam with him but uh man you know i'm, I'm out playing with my brother's my family, we all were meant to be together in this thing called the Kentucky Headhunters. Uh, we're very lucky to be still doing it. And uh, we all love music and we love to play for people. And And I'm so happy that we got a new album out and we hope that people love it. That's the main thing. Well, you guys still sound great. And I mean, thank you. It does one good thing because it, if thank you can't deliver it, don't make it. But you guys are doing it. You know, thank so. you, Jason. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you having me on your show and your, your podcast and you appreciate much. your support. And uh, the folks out there listening, check us out. Uh, you can go to KentuckyHeadhunters.com or KentuckyHeadhunters.net and check us out. Uh, there again, check my radio show out on Monday nights, uh, WDNSFM.com. I uh, also do a live stream twice a month for a company called Together, which is, let me make sure I get this right, tell you right here. Uh, it's 2GTHR.co. And I do that with Charlie Starr from, Charlie Starr does his thing, uh, Oddly Free, different guitar. It's a guitar channel, basically. Good. So it's all fun, man. We're just having fun. We'll keep the fun We're going. Good. It's, uh, it's all awesome. going to. And you're having fun too, aren't you? I am having having fun, yeah. Doing my best. Are you are you a uh, what do you are you a full time musician? Or are you what do what do you do? What, I, what's what's your main thing? My main thing, I uh, play in cover bands. I write my own music. Great. Uh, I produce my own stuff. I I use the internet for you know to get my venue going. Let's say have yes, a day job at a university. Um, I just do that, you know, play music, film well, documentary. You, know, and you keep doing on. that. You keep doing that, man. And and uh, everybody's got something to give. Everybody's got something to share, you know, yeah. and you do too. So we'll, we'll just all be out there together doing what we do, you know. We have to promote what we love, basically. That's right. As Muddy Water said, I love the life I live. I live the life I love. And that's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, Greg Martin, you're, you're a pleasure to talk to. And, uh, thank you, Jason. Lots of knowledge in there. Well, thank you, sir. God bless you, man. You take care. All right. See you later. Hey, thank you, buddy. Thank you. You edited. Make me sound like I am actually know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> of course. <laughs> see you. All right. See you, brother. Bye. Bye-bye. Right, see you.